Good evening. Wow. Uh, welcome to Karamu. We're happy to have you again this year. I understand you've been here before, and I'm so glad to see that you're back. Um, I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about Karamu, um, and I'm reading from my cheat sheet because we just changed our mission statement, so I want to make sure that you hear it exactly as we want you to. Um, our mission is to strengthen community through quality arts education programming with an emphasis on African American culture. And that's what Karamu is all about. Um, I'm just going to tell you one story. I, I said, I'm, they gave me a couple minutes, and I said, oh, can I please just tell one story? So I'm going to tell you the story about Kyle. Um, Kyle came to Karamu when he was, um, he went to the School of the Arts, and he got, was going to go to California and learn more about his trade. And what happened was he didn't have any money. So he came here to Karamu and he said, I will do anything to learn more about acting and staging and production and everything else. And so he did. And I'm happy to say that last winter he was in uh, some Great Lakes productions. He is going to be in a movie. And I was at Color Purple talking to this nice lady next to me, and it turned out to be Kyle's mother. <laughs> you know, how can that happen? So we have wonderful stories about children who came here as babies and ended up on stage and found their career or found their voice. We have stories about people who wanted to learn more and came back and learned their trade because this is a great teaching facility. Um, with that in mind, I just want to tell you, in the room adjoining, there are some brochures about the programs that we offer and our membership and the productions that will be coming up for the 2013-14 season. So I welcome you again, and I hope you enjoy your evening. Oh, and my name is Pat Egan, by the way. In case you're wondering, I often do this, you know, and some one time somebody yelled from the audience, who are you? So <laughs> I am Pat. Egan, I'm the interim executive director for Karamu House, and I'm very proud to be um, in that role right now. So thank you and welcome. <laughs> Everyone, I am glad I'm not an actor. I don't. I couldn't do this. Welcome. My name is Shakira Diaz. I am the policy director for the ACLU of Ohio. And before I go any further, I'm going to start off with a quote by Langston Hughes: "For us, censorship begins at the color line." It's a very strong statement, and we still continue to see iterations of that, of how African American. Uh, writers and authors are censored in many different ways. I want to welcome you on behalf of the entire staff of the ACLU of Ohio. This is one of our favorite programs to put on every year. We're often very excited to just get ready for it, to, to identify the passages, and we want to collectively welcome you and thank you for continuing to support this program. This evening, our theme is Black Liberation. And while we celebrate uh, Banned Books Week every year, we were given even more motivation to continue to do this program when the president of the State Board of Education labeled the book, The Bluest Eye, by Toni Morrison as pornography a book that many uh, people around the world value, written by an Ohio native who has received almost every literary award there is to win. So we responded uh, as an organization, and we stood up for Toni Morrison, and we stood up for the right to read, and we stood up for the right to learn, and many of our members and supporters around the state joined us in that support, 
And we're now hearing that people all around the country and even Canada are joining us in our support of Toni Morrison. Uh, you'll notice in your program this evening that in addition to, to seeing the selections uh, from our readers tonight, on the back side of it, you'll see how to take action and support Toni Morrison and the right to read. If you haven't already taken action, we urge you to do so. Uh, you can do it this evening. You can give a call to the State Board of Education president or send her an email because uh, we, we don't want our educators, our leading educators, to be supporting or promoting censorship, right? Right. right. That's why we're here tonight. I have the honor this evening of introducing a man that requires no introduction. James Hardiman, our uh, legal director for the ACLU of Ohio, who is a strong proponent of education. He is the reason why Cleveland schools are not segregated. So I want to call to the microphone our very own homegrown freedom fighter, James Hardiman. That was a very kind comment from Shakira. Actually, she should have said, a person that needs all the introduction that he can get. Uh, as Shakira indicated, I am currently the legal director for the American Civil Liberties Union of Ohio, a position I've held for the past three years, a position that I'm very, very proud to have because we do defend civil liberties and civil rights every day that we are on this earth. Black liberationists have often been the most outspoken voices for change. While writing and speaking out, America frequently stifles the individual voices of people of color, including many black liberation writers. In order to combat these various forms of censorship, many groups have created their own media outlets and platforms so that their voices would be heard. In honor of Banned Books Week, our readers tonight will read selections from several black writers who were censored for speaking out against a system that contained, constrained them. Banned brilliance is an opportunity to highlight the racism, censorship, sexism, and inequity. Starting things off this evening is Dante Gibbs. Dante is the Director of Youth Engagement at Neighborhood Leadership Institute where he plans and implements youth programs. A Cleveland native, or should I say East Cleveland native, uh, Dante graduated from Shaw High School receiving his bachelor's degree and master's of applied social science or from the Mandel School of Applied Social Science from Case Western Reserve University. He's the recipient of the Movers and Shakers Award from the 2030 Cleveland Professional Club and was recognized as a top 30 alum under the age of 30 from Case Western Reserve University. This evening, Dante Gibbs will read, I Have Seen, a poem by Petri Thomas, named Juan Pedro Tom Tomas by his parents. He was renamed John Peter Thomas by the staff at the hospital where he was born. Mr. Thomas went by Perry. He was the only dark-skinned child of his parents' seven children. Mr. Tom Thomas felt ostracized by his family and his Spanish Harlem neighborhood and struggled with the harsh realities of racism and poverty. Mr. Thomas was involved in drug sales, drug use, and gang affiliation. After being convicted of an attempted armed robbery, he served seven years in prison. During his imprisonment, he wrote his autobiography titled, Down These Mean Streets, which was published in 1967. Upon his release from prison, Mr. Thomas was very involved in community and youth outreach. He also published Savior, Savior, Hold My Hand, Seven Long Times, Stories from El Barrio. Down These Mean Streets has either been banned or challenged in Salinas, California, Teaneck, New Jersey, Darien, Connecticut, District 25 in Queens, New York, New York City, and in Long Island. Dante Gibbs.
Thank you, James, for that wonderful introduction. And I just want to share briefly one of the reasons why I chose this piece by Piri Thomas. I chose it because, as James mentioned, he grew up in Spanish Harlem and had to deal with racism and poverty. And I also grew up in East Cleveland, so that's another neighborhood that's been impoverished through poverty. And the odds are against me at this very moment. I'm either supposed to be dead or in prison. But um, Mr. Thomas, he you know, went the street route and got caught up in the street life. I got caught up in the book life. So school was kind of my outlet. But with that being said, um, I was really able to connect with this because upon graduating and upon his release, we both were able to get into community and youth outreach. And notice how I said upon graduating and upon release. I can use those words synonymously because my alma mater, Shaw High School, now resembles and functions as a school, I mean, as a prison. So that whole school to prison pipeline is something that's dear to my heart and it's very real. So without further ado, I have seen by Piri Thomas. I have seen many a beautiful beach, the whole world within tranquility's reach, the mighty power of the human mind, which has within its grasp the unity, the purity of total entwinement in a world that can be totally changed from the planet Earth to planet freedom. I send my soul on wings of thoughts to reach and find and bring what I've sought, to try to hurt no one, though hurt has been my middle name, but never will I accept this part of the shame that society's hatred has brought upon all of us. Like a thundering, hateful, crashing rain, I'd rather be like lightning, for it has no earthly gate. It strikes the earth naturally and not with deadly hate. I'd rather be like thunder, for that is children's shout. I'd rather be a tear of sorrow than a smile of arrogance. I know not which way my words will be borne by the wind, but I do know that I plant the seed among all the people of my earth deep within, that all could stand with a loving hand and share our most beautiful land. I say I come to be with thee, my brother and sister. I'll never hate the color or creed, but whether fight the individuals whose lust for power has made them personifications of human greed. Don't they know we only wish to live in total peace? Thank you. I send my soul on wings of thought to reach and find and bring what I have sought. The way that thoughts, ideas, words can inspire and spread is a powerful thing. It's this power that has often led to censorship. Next, I'd like to introduce Edward Little. Ed Little is a national expert in criminal and juvenile justice with extensive knowledge and experience in the areas of workforce development, strategic planning, racial and social justice, policy analysis, and legislative reform, offender reentry, youth violence prevention, and intervention. Ed Little has consulted on several federal research projects and initiatives dealing with criminal, racial, and social justice issues, as well as in numerous Ohio school districts to provide mentoring and improve high school graduation rates. Currently, Ed Little consults with several school districts to address the school to prison pipeline. Ed Little will read A Defined Voice, a poem from Voices from Solidarity, The Louder My Voice, The Deeper They Hurt, Bury Me by Herman Wallace. Herman Wallace is currently still incarcerated in the Louisiana State Penitentiary. In 1971, with two other prisoners, Mr. Wallace formed a chapter of the Black Panthers in the prison to, nonviolent, to address nonviolent uh, opposition against segregation, systemic corruption, and abuse occurring in the prison partially to silence their efforts, which were gaining national media attention. Mr. Wallace and one of his co-organizers were convicted of murdering a prison guard. 
Though there was little evidence that he had committed the crime, Mr. Wallace was placed in solitary confinement. He remained there for more than four decades with little contact to the outside world. Numerous requests from journalists to interview, interview Mr. Wallace have been denied, making it difficult to accurately tell his story. Earlier this summer, Mr. Wallace was diagnosed with terminal liver cancer. This tragic turn of events led to increased calls to release Mr. Wallace from prison, and he was recently allowed to leave solitary confinement after four decades. This does not erase the psychological treatment and isolation he unjustly experienced for more than 41 years. However, despite being censored in the most extreme way possible, Mr. Wallace says he still believes wholeheartedly in justice, peace, and the power of the people. Let's give a welcome to Mr. Ed Little. Thank you, Mr. Hardiman. Thank you all for coming tonight. The reason I chose this particular passage is because I can closely relate to Mr. Herman Wallace and his situation. From the age of 18 to the age of 32, I was in Ohio's prison system. At the age of 19, I found myself in maximum security. I went to prison as a boy, came home as a man. And while I was there, I worked to educate myself and prepare myself for my eventual release. And since I have been home, I have worked to eradicate injustice, to help individuals who are returning back into this community, like I did, to have a smooth transition and get the help that they need. So without further ado, I would like to read a defined voice. They removed my whisper from general population. To maximum security, I gained a voice. They removed my voice from maximum security to administrative segregation. My voice gave hope. They removed my voice from administrative segregation to solitary confinement. My voice became a vibration of unity. They removed my voice from solitary confinement to the supermax of Camp J. And now they wish to destroy me. The louder my voice, the deeper they bury me. I said, the louder my voice, the deeper they bury me. Free all political prisoners. Prisoners of war, prisoners of consciousness. Thank you. The louder my voice, the deeper they bury me. Strong words from a strong man. Next, I would like to introduce another strong man, Gary Williams. Gary Williams has had a long and successful career as a lawyer, legal educator, and more recently as an artist. He worked as a prosecutor in the city of Cleveland in the civil division of the municipal law department in both Cleveland and the city of Shaker Heights. He went on to serve as a law professor at Cleveland Marshall School of Law, my alma mater, and later on as an assistant dean of student affairs. Gary Williams is now a full-time artist painting in pastels, oils, and watercolors. And I'm sure he'd appreciate it if you would buy some of his artwork. <laughs> uh, Mr. Williams will read a selection from Martial Law, The Life and Times of a Baltimore Black Panther by Marshall Eddie Conway and Dominique Stevenson. Marshall Eddie Conway was the Minister of Defense for the Baltimore chapter of the Black Panther Party. In 1971, he was convicted of murdering a police officer and sentenced to life in prison. There were several controversies involving the trial and conviction of Mr. Conway, including the reliability of a jailhouse informant and issues with legal representation. 
Mr. Conway fired two of his lawyers instead of request, and instead requested a cellmate attorney, Arthur Turco, be appointed to represent him. This request was denied. Throughout his incarceration, Mr. Conway has maintained his innocence and argues that he is a political prisoner. In 2001, the Baltimore City Council passed a resolution urging the governor of Maryland to pardon him. However, Mr. Conway is still incarcerated. Through his autobiography, Martial Law, Mr. Conway shares his political awakening in the military, activism in the Black Panther Party, the realities of prison life, and much more. The book was banned at the Maryland Correctional Training Center because the author and the inmates whose photos appear in the book failed to notify the victims of their crimes of the books or the book's present uh, publication. However, however, after a lawyer for the ACLU, wasn't me, questioned the censorship, Maryland correctional officials lifted the ban in 2011. Please welcome Gary Williams. I chose this reading because the Black Panther Party found its beginnings at the time when I was growing up. Uh, a lot of my friends, a, a lot of my relatives were part of the Black Panther movement. And in a lot of ways, like Mr. Conway found that it was one of the best solutions to what he perceived as a problem. I, I think myself and my generation felt the same way. Martial law. Resistance is a natural response to oppression. And the story of people of African descent in the Western Hemisphere is one of rebellion and broken shackles. Women and men marching on. These ragtag armies of black, brown, and yellow soldiers armed with farm tools, the occasional musket, and a plan to kill the state to kill the slave master. Rising up out of their bondage, the rebels intended to be free in this world or the next. Get free or die trying. Charles Delon, Macandal, Nat Turner. These names would produce a fear so strong in the whites that the thought of an armed and angry black man would echo that fear for generations to come. The race struggles of the late 1960s called to mind the same fear and anger. Eventually, our small group split three ways. One segment wanted to go with the nationalist movement, another wanted to continue working in a small group. And the third wanted to join the Panthers. Obviously, I was in the latter. I had come to believe that something very serious was happening to black people. And it was neither a local phenomenon, nor was it totally about racial discrimination. We couldn't continue to address the plight of black people through lawsuits and Supreme Court rulings as the Civil Rights Movement had done. Black people in the North had already been asserting their right to vote, but we were still treated as second-class citizens. It wasn't just an issue of going to the polls. The struggle then as now was about human rights. I believed that the promise was larger than it appeared and that the Black Panther Party had the best program for addressing it. Those of us who felt like the Black Panther Party was the answer actively searched out local Panthers and joined up with them only to find that the Baltimore Black Panthers were very few. And being a relatively new chapter, it was unorganized. It would become my mission for the next several years to build and develop the Black Panther Party Baltimore branch. Thank you.
Those are strong words coming from a former prosecutor. <laughs> we uh, are going to have to make a slight change. Daniel Gray Contar was scheduled to read from uh, Soul on Ice. Sound familiar? Eldridge Cleaver. Unfortunately, Mr. Contar has not been here, so hopefully he'll arrive before we have to uh, close the program. That being the case, our next reader is Aaliyah Wallace. Aaliyah is a freshman at the Cleveland School of the Arts. Her passion is to express herself and her beliefs with the world. She's been involved in many programs, such as the Soapbox and Mika, Mikov, Mikov, thank you, <laughs> program, and also a winner of both previous speech competitions. Ms. Wallace has been very fortunate to have performed in many plays and musicals, including working for the Cleveland Public Theater, the STEP program, uh, and she has participated in original plays that she has written and performed. Ms. Wallace will read a poem this evening by Asata Shakur. While most of tonight's authors have had their works banned or challenged, Ms. Shakur herself has been challenged. Ms. Shakur was incarcerated in several prisons throughout the 1970s. She escaped in 1979 and has been living in Cuba in political asylum since 1984. In 2005, the FBI classified her as a domestic terrorist. In 2013, she became the first woman on this list of most wanted terrorists. Ms. Wallace, please come to the mic. Thank you. Um, the reason I chose this piece was because me being involved in soapbox competitions is my way of carrying on the tradition and the title of this piece is called The Tradition. Carry it on now, carry it on. Carry it on now, carry it on, carry on the tradition. There were black people since the childhood of time who carried it on. In Ghana, in Mali, in Timbuktu, we carried it on, carried on the tradition. We hid in the bush when the slave masters came holding spear and when the moment was ripe, leaped out and lanced the lifeblood of our would-be masters. We carried it on. On the slave ships, hurling ourselves into oceans, slitting the throats of our captors, we took their whips and their ships. Blood flowed in the Atlantic, and it wasn't all ours. We carried it on. Fed missy arsenic apple pies, stole the axes from the shed, went and chopped off master's head. We ran. We fought. We organized a railroad, an underground. We carried it on. In newspapers, in meetings, in arguments, in street fights, we carried it on. In tales told to children, in chants and cantatas, in poems, in blues songs, in saxophone screams, we carried it on. In classrooms, in churches, in courtrooms, in prisons, we carried it on. On soapboxes, in picket lines, welfare lines, unemployment, our lives on the line, we carried it on. In sit-ins, in pray-ins, in march-ins, in die-ins, we carried it on on cold Missouri midnights, pinning shotguns against lynch mobs, on, mob on burning Brooklyn streets, pitting rocks against rifles, we carried it on, against water hoses and bulldogs, against nightsticks and bullets, against tanks and tear gas, needles and nooses, bombs and birth control, we carried it on. In Selma and San Juan, Mozambique, Mississippi, in Brazil and in Boston, we carried it on. Through the lies and the sellouts, the mistakes and the madness, through pain and hunger and frustration, we carried it on. Carried on the tradition. Carried a strong tradition. Carried a proud tradition. Carried a black tradition. Carry it on. Pass it down to the children. Pass it down. Carry it on. Carry it on now. Carry it on to freedom. Thank you. Remember the name. You heard it here first. Aaliyah Wallace. She's a freshman, so wait till she becomes a senior. 
Uh, our next reader is Wendy Lawson. Uh, Wendy Lawson works at Orbital Research, recruiting engineers and overseeing benefits management and grants. She's also an ACLU of Ohio board member. In this capacity, Wendy Lawson guides the direction of the organization, raises funds to support its work, and lobbies on behalf of the ACLU with legislators. While passionate about ACLU work and ACLU issues, Wendy has a specific interest in addressing prison reform and racial profiling. Of course, we're in a post-racial society, so that doesn't really occur. <laughs> Ms. Lawson will read I, Too, by someone you may have heard of, Langston Hughes. A graduate of Cleveland's Central High School, Langston Hughes was a familiar face at this Caramu Theater. He taught art classes and wrote his first pay play, The Golden Piece, at Caramu. He wrote and debut debuted several other works at Caramu House, including the musical, uh, the musical later to be known as Black Nativity, which I assume you've all seen. An annual presentation at Caramu. Although Mr. Hughes traveled the world and moved to New York's Harlem neighborhood, as an adult, he never forgot Cleveland or Caramo. He continued to visit throughout his life as he sought inspiration for his writings. Please welcome Mr. Mrs. Lawson to the stage. Wendy. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, James. Langston Hughes holds a particular soft spot in my heart because he is a poet. Many of his works still resonate with us today. He talked to the average person. His works are timeless and will be with us. I am doing I Too. I Too. I Too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen. When company comes, but I laugh, and eat well, and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen, then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I, too, am America. Thank you. Langston Hughes attended Central High School, and most of you are too young to remember Central High School. If you're my age, you remember it was this old dilapidated building on East 55th Street. But he learned his craft or honed his craft here at Caramel House, and I think we owe a debt of gratitude for Langston Hughes putting uh, uh, Caramel on the theatrical map. Uh, next, we will have Michelle Broom. Ms. Broom serves as the Community Action Coordinator for the St. Clair Superior Development Corporation. She served the neighborhood and organization since March of 2003. Her primary role is to build relationships between people in the neighborhood, initiate building efforts for the neighborhood through facilitating various neighborhood community action groups. She's responsible for encouraging and mobilizing residents to take on leadership roles and act to improve the quality of life for themselves and the community. Michelle Broom assists in training new community leaders and community organizers. She serves on the board of Neighborhood Leadership Institute, a graduate of Neighborhood Leadership, Cleveland, class of 19, serves on the Neighborhood Leadership Institute Alumni Committee. She's an ambassador with Neighborhood Connections and a mentor with the Youth Young Nonprofit Professional Networks of Cleveland. Prior to her service, at the St. Clair Superior Development Corporation, Michelle worked for St. Martin de Porres Family Center, Greater Cleveland Habitat for Humanity, as an AmeriCorps VISTA worker, Hope Christian Academy, and the ACLU of Ohio Foundation. Ms. Broom will read from Beloved by Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison's Beloved was inspired by the true story of Mark Margaret Garner, 
an African-American slave who escaped slavery in Kentucky by crossing the frozen Ohio River into Cincinnati, Ohio, a free state with her husband Robert and her children. Slave catchers and U.S. Marshals came to Cincinnati to retrieve Margaret and her family back to Kentucky under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which gave slave owners the right to pursue slaves across state boundaries. Robert Garner fired several shots and wounded at least one deputy marshal. Margaret killed her two-year-old daughter with a butcher knife rather than see her child return to slavery. She had wounded her other children, preparing to kill them and herself when she was subdued by the posse. Beloved's main character, Seth, kills her daughter and tries to kill her other three children when a posse arrives in Ohio to return them to Sweet Home, the Kentucky plantation from which Seth fled. Beloved has been challenged by St. John's County Schools in St. Augustine, Florida, 1995, by a member of the uh, Maine School Committee, 1997, Sarasota County, Florida Schools, 1998, and most recently in, 19, in 2013, this year by a parent in Fairfax County, Virginia, who opposed the book's content. The Fairfax County Board of Education overruled the parents' challenge. Most recently, Ohio Board of uh, Education President Debbie Turhart labeled another novel by Morrison, The Bluest Eye, as pornographic and call for its removal from state teaching guidelines for high school students. Please welcome Ms. Broom to the stage. Good evening. It's really great to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I chose this passage uh, prior to reading the book. So I have a unique story. When I read the passage that I'm going to read, um, what came to mind was being a little girl and hearing my mom and my dad. I was born in the 70s. I'm telling my age a little bit. Um, my mom and dad reiterate to me how beautiful I was and not to compare yourself to anyone and how you're also not better. You're no better than anyone, but then also no one is better than you. So it's about self-love and I, uh, I don't know, it called to me. So, beloved. Here, she said, in this place here, we flesh, flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it, love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. They don't love your eyes. They just as soon pick them out. No more do they love the skin on your back. Yonder, they flay it. And oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together. Stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You got to love it, you. And no, they ain't in love with your mouth. Yonder, out there, they will see it broken and break it again. What you say out of it, they will not heed. What you scream from it, they do not hear. What you put into it to nourish your body, they will snatch away and give you leavings instead. No, they don't love your mouth. You got to love it. This is flesh I'm talking about here. Flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance. Backs that need support. Shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. And oh, my people are yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck, unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it, grace it, stroke it and hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just soon slop for hogs. You got to love them. 
the dark, dark liver, love it. Love it and the beat and beating heart, love that too. More than eye or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than your life-holding womb and your life-giving private parts. Hear me now, love your heart, for this is the prize. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I just think some people would like to deprive our youth of the genius of Toni Morrison. The good news is I will not be reading from Soul on Ice. <laughs> uh, Daniel Gray Contar has arrived. Mr. Gray teaches creative writing at the Cleveland School of the Arts and is also a consultant for the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and Arts Educator for the Progressive Arts Alliance. He will be reading a selection by Eldridge Cleaver, as I said previously, Soul on Ice. As you may know, Eldridge was born in Arkansas and grew up in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. In 1954, I think he was 19 at the time, he was convicted of marijuana possession and sent to the California State Prison at Soledad. After his release in 1957, he was convicted of assault with intent to murder and incarcerated at San Quentin and later on at Folsom Prison. After his release in 1966, Mr. Cleaver joined the Black Panther Party, eventually becoming editor of the party's newspaper. Through his cultural critique, Soul on Ice, and leadership in the party, Eldridge Cleaver became a symbol of black rebellion in the turbulent 1960s. Soul on Ice has been banned numerous times since it was first published in 1968. But the most extensive challenge began in 1976 when school board members in Island Trees Free School, District Number 26 in New York City, ordered librarians to remove the, the title and several other books from within the school library. The book was charged with being immoral and just plain filthy. The book was returned to the library after the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Board of Education, Island Trees, Union Free School, District Number 26, versus PICO, that by banning the books, the First Amendment rights of students had been violated. In 1982, the book was returned to the school's shelves. Give me, join with me in giving Mr. Gray Contar a round of applause. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, I chose Soul on Ice um, because I, I lived in Oakland um, working um, as a PhD candidate um, for about five years. And um, I not only lived in Oakland, but I lived in the very neighborhood where the Black Panther Party was um, found it. This was a very intentional choice. When I think about us unpacking Eldridge Cleaver, I can't help but right now think about the students that I teach. And I'm going to share a very quick story and then I'll read this. Uh, my students recently, just last week, we watched um, Free Angela and All Political Prisoners. If you haven't seen that documentary, I highly suggest that you check it out. So we watched it over the course of two days, and the students looked at me, and they said, Mr. Gray, why don't we have this history? And it's difficult for me to unpack for them succinctly why they don't have it. But what's important to know is that they know that they don't have it. A couple of days after we watched it, we got news that the bluest eye was banned. And the students remembered Free Angela. And they remembered. And they said, see, they don't want us to have this history. They don't want us to have this legacy. Our students, I'm telling you for them, that they are becoming politicized slowly but surely. And they do recognize the importance of the not too distant past, whether it come from Angela Davis or Eldridge Cleaver 
or the Soledad brothers, they know these folks. They know what's happened here in Cleveland. They know about both race riots. They're clear, one of my students is in the back with their mom. Thanks for being here. They know. So I wanna just go ahead and read this um, passage from Eldridge, from Soul on Ice, the black man's stake in Vietnam. This is the last act of the show. We are living in a time when the people of the world are making their final bid for full and complete freedom. Never before in history has this condition prevailed. Always before, there have been more or less articulate and aware pockets of people, portions of classes, etc. But today's is an era of mass awareness. When the smallest man on the street is in rebellion against the system which has denied him life, and which he has come to understand robs him of his dignity and self-respect. Yet he's being told that it'll take time to get programs started, time to pass legislation, time to educate white people into accepting the idea that black people want and deserve freedom but it is physically impossible to move as fast as the black man would like to move. Black men are deadly serious when they say freedom now. Even if the white man wanted to eradicate all traces of evil overnight, he would not be able to do it because the economic and political system would not permit it. All talk about going too fast is treasonous to the black man's future. What the white man must be brought to understand is that the black man in America today is fully aware of his position. And he does not intend to be tricked again into another, another hundred year forfeit of freedom. Not for a single moment or for any price will the black man now rising up in America settle for anything less than their full proportionate share and participation in the sovereignty of America. The black man has already come to realization that to be free, it is necessary for him to throw his life, to throw everything on the line, because the oppressors refuse to understand that it is now impossible for them to come up with another trick to squelch the black revolution. The black man can't afford to take a chance. He can't afford to put things off. He must stop the whole show now and get his business straight. Because if he does not do it now, if he fails to grasp securely the reins of this historic opportunity, there may be no tomorrow for him. Elders Cleveland. Strong words from a strong man. I feel this connection that uh, uh, we had the benefit of Daniel Gray Contour, who grew up in the neighborhood where Eldridge Cleaver made his name. Uh, Cleaver represents a voice of urgency in a decade of social change and turmoil here in the United States. His writings call for action when our backs are against the wall and the need for decisive action in the face of prejudice. Our final selection tonight will be read by Terrence Spivey. He's the artistic director here at the Caramu House, performing arts and theater director in residence at the Kent State University Pan-African Studies program. Terrence will read a passage from Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818, the son of a slave woman and an unknown white man. Growing up, he was exposed to the degradations of slavery, witnessing firsthand brutal whippings and spending much time cold and hungry. When he was eight years old, he was sent to Baltimore to live with a ship carpenter named Hugh Old. While in Baltimore, Mr. Old's wife began teaching Douglas the alphabet. However, it did not last long, for when Mr. Old discovered these lessons, he strictly forbade it in words that left a profound impression on Frederick Douglass that while knowledge and learning of the world around him could bring him great unhappiness, it would also give him great power over his enslavers who preferred their chattel to remain ignorant and unthinking. Going to Baltimore, Douglas um, 
was hired out to a farm run by a notoriously brutal slave breaker named Edward Covey. Whipped daily and barely fed, Douglas was broken in, body, soul, and spirit. Douglas spent the next three years planning his escape from slavery and finally earning his freedom in 1838. Douglas continues to be a prime example of how to overcome silence with the power of your voice. Mr. Terrence Spivey. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Caramel. I, uh, as a kid, uh, I used to read, look at the illustrations of slaves. And uh, I remember seeing an illustration of a young slave getting whipped. And as I continued to turn the page, it was like a flip, like a film. It showed this young man custody grabbing. He grabs the whip and pulls the slave master down to the ground. That was a young Frederick Douglass. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, and from the time being, putting all other tumults to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral of one, or it may be a physical, a moral one. Or it may be both moral and physical. But it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to. And you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they resist it with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. Thank you. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. Contemporary accounts of Frederick Douglass vaguely allude to the controversy surrounding the liberation work he did in the 1800s. Time tends to soothe the rough edges of history. It also provides an opportunity for historians to edit historical accounts to be more appealing to those living today. This censorship of Douglass is different from others that we've explored this evening. This rewriting of history is not the censorship of Douglass himself, but an attempt to erase, to censor his work and that of other liberators liberationists in exchange for a ro rosier picture of our past. I was reading not too long ago an account of what Abraham Lincoln would think of Barack Obama. And we all know that Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And following the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War, there was the uh, uh, amendment to eliminate involuntary servitude but we also know that there was not a whole lot of love between Abraham Lincoln and the slaves. But there was one person that he respected, and I think history will document this fact, and that person was Frederick Douglass. Tonight, we've celebrated the resilience of black people and the ongoing fight for freedom. Speaking of resilience, I know that I don't have to tell you about the ongoing struggles and attempts to 
uh, uh, block the African-American vote. We cannot let you leave tonight without asking you to join us in sharing voting rights material throughout the community. Stop by our literature table to pick up your voting rights material and information about other opportunities to fight for freedom. This is an opportunity. The fight is not over. The battle continues. Thank you very much for coming tonight.